to me what blows my mind is everybody loves the NCAA basketball tournament for women. People love UConn. People cheer for UConn every year. People want to see these women play. These women are awesome players. And then what happens when you flip from taking the kid from college and making her a professional athlete that nobody's interested? Like, I don't understand what that gap is. I don't think anybody does. Otherwise, we would have fixed it by now. But like, there is some loss of interest between a woman in college and a woman who's a professional athlete. Hello and welcome to the Women Who Roar podcast. It's female leaders talking about crushing work, money, and life. I'm Shreya Chabe. I'm Sarah Walter. And I'm Jess Jackson. So we're so excited to welcome our guest for today, Jessica McCord. Jessica most recently came from One Team Partners, where she was managing national sales across six different professional sports players associations. She worked with high-profile athletes like Rob Gronkowski and Larry Fitzgerald in order to drive strategic partnerships across brands like Pepsi, Vidco, and Main Event Entertainment. In her past experience, Jessica has worked at prestigious brands such as Rock Nation, Sports Illustrated, and USA Today Sports. She's managed relationships across blue-chip brands such as Visa, MasterCard, Pepsi, Mars and Norwegian Cruise Lines. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for being here. So tell us, how did you get into the big world of sports and sports marketing? So very funny, I stumbled into marketing before the sports. I grew up being an athlete. I played softball and golf. Um, I skied. Um, my father was very much an avid sports watcher, so sports was always on in the house. But my father actually also was in the business of marketing and advertising. So I got to grow up watching my dad, uh, who was the director of partnerships for AIG um, for many, many years, probably 20 years, doing these really impressive partnerships around golf and tennis and athletes um, and really bringing his brand to life. So that's how I got started. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and tell us like about the origin story of, of getting into, into brand marketing and, and working with some of these incredible brands that, that we had in your introduction. Yeah. Um, so I worked at Time Inc., uh, which no longer exists. It's now Meredith Corporation. But Time Inc. back in the day was in style, people, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated. Um, and I was very fortunate to get my first job out of college at Time. And then I worked my way up to Sports Illustrated. It was very hard to get there. And you had to put in a lot of work and a lot of hours. But um, Sports Illustrated was always kind of my pinnacle of that was the first real goal I had set for myself in my career was get to Sports Illustrated and then figure it out after that. Why Sports Illustrated specifically? You know, back then um, when I, I was first coming out of college in 2001, Sports Illustrated was like, that was it. That was, you know, ESPN was dominating TV, but Sports Illustrated was dominating print in the magazine industry. And then, you know, all of the kind of awards that they would give for Sportsman of the Year, um, the swimsuit issue. They just had these like really, really strong brands that were tied into Sports Illustrated. So it was it was just where I wanted to be. It's where I knew I wanted to be. I love that. What was your experience like working there when you started? Um, totally not what I thought it would be. Like you go <laughs> to Sports <laughs> Illustrated and you think it's this like heavily male dominated, like we read about sports all day. And it was really like the best place I've ever worked. Um, I had incredible male leaders that I learned from that allowed me to find a voice and to have a voice in an industry where you don't always necessarily feel like women have that opportunity. Um, in addition, I got there at the time where the swimsuit issue was really finding its own voice and its own self, where it wasn't just a magazine that, you know, you were boys were getting in the mail and like flipping through <laughs> to see what the bathing suits were. Um, it was really becoming this platform for women to speak about empowerment and for inclusion and to really see different shapes and body sizes in swimsuits and say that this is accepted. Um, that was really not happening anywhere else and Sports Illustrated was really paving the path for that, I think. And Sports Illustrated, correct me if I'm wrong here, just had their first pregnant person featured in the swimsuit issue? They had their first pregnant uh, person featured, and they also think had their first over 70 model featured wow. as well. So they're really breaking down the barriers still, and I'm very <laughs> proud of my friends that still work there. <laughs> so you mentioned um, that you, you wanted to join Sports Illustrated because of where the brand was heading at the time um, and, you know, where, where it ended up by the time you had left. Can you talk to us a bit more about that and how the brands fitted into that? 
Yeah, I think it was super interesting for me to watch because when I first joined, you saw the traditional Budweiser ads and, you know, the horses on the back with the Super Bowl ads. and um, Clydesdale. The Clydesdales, exactly. <laughs> it was all really male-dominated, right? And it was like, picture Super Bowl commercials in a magazine or online. Um, and what happened was as the swimsuit evolution was happening, we started pivoting and having different conversations. And we started saying, men are not the only people that are reading this. Women are reading the Sports Illustrated swimsuit publication because they love the bikinis, because they love the fashion, because they love the inclusivity. And so we would go to a brand like Mars, who traditionally would run Snickers because Snickers was all about fantasy football and they were a sponsor of the NFL. Well, instead of running that, we started talking about M&Ms. M&Ms would usually run in People magazine or InStyle magazine because they were targeting a female audience. We were able to bring... M&Ms to the back cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue, and we dressed Miss Green up <laughs> in her Stuart Weitzman boots and her little bikini, and we posed her on the beach, and it was the first time ever for five consecutive years that there was a model on the back cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue, and it was Miss Green M&M, and that was the first time that they'd really ever advertised in a heavily male publication because there was this evolution that was happening. I'm actually really surprised to learn that M&Ms is targeting a female audience. Like, it never... That never would have occurred to me that moms that, are buying the candy at Halloween. Moms I guess that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I remember like when Milk came out with their whole whatever that massive marketing campaign was. I remember collecting those, and I remember collecting M and M's mm -hmm. like tear outs from magazines. Yeah, the ads were really cool. It was amazing, and it was um, you know every year we tried to pair who is Ms. Green going to emulate next? And it was uh, one of the last years, it was Christy Brinkley, and it was for the 50th anniversary of the swimsuit uh, issue. And it was it was great. It was just really a fun play and a play that I don't think would have been able to have been pulled off five years before that. You know what's amazing to me is to really think about um, body positivity mm -hmm. in the way that you are describing um, Sports Illustrator kind of tried to own that from a very, very early stage. And it's been, what, 15 or 20 years since, and still, uh, you know, if you look at the way brands are, you know, uh, putting content out in this space, we still haven't solved that problem. No. And and the, and it's it's kind of depressing to actually think, will we ever get to a point where we actually have a real solution? Yeah, I mean, I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful, and I think that it takes a brand like Sports Illustrated that has a voice and a platform and a megaphone to say, I don't care what my reputation is going to be. I stand by the statement because it's the right statement and it is the right opportunity for us to stand up and talk about this. Um, more brands need to be doing that. You look at Victoria's Secrets of the world, you look at, you know, um, different fashion houses and the images that they portray of what women should look like. And I think that we can we can be better. So not to break, I, I assume it's a competitor, but ESPN, I think, has done a really good issue. job. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and especially their featuring of female athletes in particular mm -hmm. of like, it isn't just like what looks pretty on a magazine page. It's like your body is like, it's functional. It's, it's real. strong. It's real. It's all of these things. And mm -hmm. I think that's been really cool to see. I totally agree. And I, I just saw an announcement um, because I do still have friends that work there, so I keep up with it. Um, but they're going to feature five WNBA players in the swimsuit issue this year. And I think that's really important um, because I love what the W stands for. Do you think that like it's easier for sports houses to kind of get on board with that versus say like a fashion house? And the reason I ask is because, you know, there's been an evolution of, of fashion over many, many, many decades. But part of that fashion has also been what the objective ideal female body should look like, right? Like it's not... The, the nicest topic to kind of bring up. No, but, it's fair yeah. because like with sports, you sort of get away with like their body looks like this because, right? right. And it's like serving this purpose. Because they're using it. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Whereas like I get your point, Jess, like in fashion, it might, you might, might not necessarily be just be able to like kind of pull that off. But isn't right, the conversation but. about fitness also, right? Your body looks a certain way, but what can it do for you? Um, yeah, and, yeah and that's and what we're saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. and, and so it's like... Sports can own that whole narrative on, on, on body positivity. They can, yeah. but, you know, Lizzo can too. Lizzo just right, came right. out with a whole line of inclusive shapewear that starts at size 6X and right. then comes down to size 2 or, what, or 0 or whatever it might be. So she's flipped the entire narrative on its head and said, we start plus size and then we'll make sure to include people who aren't as and well. And I think the cool thing about the Lizzo 
uh, thing is that it's not like shapewear to like hide things. It's like loud shapewear. Wear it outside. Wear it on a walk. It's like I'm wearing athleisure um, and it's hot pink and it's bringing attention to this like in a really cool way. In a really positive way. So we're getting there. So with Sports Illustrated in particular, we've talked a little bit about you joining a company um, in a brand that was geared more towards initially the male audience and how that changed over time given kind of society evolving and and the brand evolving and all Mm -hmm. those things. Um, I guess fast forward a little bit now, like can you tell us about how you've seen other brands do that and sort of embrace what's going on socially and evolve their strategy and and how they market themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're seeing it more and more um, as brands are finding the ability to step up and really stand for something and not have to apologize for standing for something. Um, Rock Nation, one of my favorite things that I've ever been a part of was um, I got to work directly with Meek Mill. And um, I knew Meek when he was in prison for a parole violation that, you know, was not a thing that should have happened because it was in the middle of a a music video shoot and he was popping a wheelie um, and that was considered parole violation. So um, we spent a lot of time trying to get him out of prison and to advocate for him, not just for him, but for for millions of people that are in uh, the court system right now and the justice system that shouldn't be. Um, so we had great people like Robert Kraft and, you know, these really high high profile people coming together to form the Reform Alliance. And it stood for social justice equality. And that was a platform that was available to Meek when he got out of jail. Um, and we were tasked to find brands that would want to partner with him. There's not a lot of brands that that want to step up and take that responsibility. But there were brands like Puma, like GoPuff, um, really, really, really important brands that were donating money to his foundation on his behalf. So at that point, it becomes about the messaging and not about making that person money. The money and the transaction of the business that we're so used to in athletes and talent goes away and it becomes about what we stand for and helping other people. And I think that Rock Nation is one of the very few places that unapologetically stood up for that. And, um, you know, Meek was just one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. Like, I stand by that guy no matter what. Yeah. I think it's interesting, too, because part of it is, like, standing up for something before, like, it's, I guess it's more of a signaling if you're like the first domino, right? As opposed yeah. to the last domino. Yep. So I think kind of case in point of what's been going on the past couple of years, like I think the first brands that really stood up for what was going on in terms of like social justice and things like that, I think has a massive impact, but it's also such a hard position to be in of like, I'm putting myself out there. I mean, you know, go back to GoPuff. We were just talking about this. I think this fits really well into what's going on right now, but GoPuff was the first brand to stand up and say, I'm going to give every single college student a deal when they sign up for Open Doors, which is a platform that connects brands to collegiate athletes. So every athlete had the opportunity to go out and get their first brand deal. And they wanted to be first to market, and they were. Um, I don't know how well that did for them. I don't know that it made the impact that, you know, they got that PR that first week out. They were the first ones out of the gate. But where's the sustaining initiative? Where's the sustaining effort now? Um, And I think that they have to go back and re-strategize and really rethink how they are marketing collegiate athletes to make an impact for their brand. So, right. But you could also say, like, do you think that GoPuff, while maybe it wasn't amazing for their bottom line, like started that chain reaction, right? And yes. forced other people to follow. So like for the greater good, maybe. They yes. Did. People started to stand up and listen when they heard that GoPuff had been behind the scenes working on that deal very quietly. Um, so I do think it made an impact, but I still don't think that people have figured out what college NIL is and how to effectively use it. And I think that's something that we all, as leaders in the sports business industry, we need to help. They need our help right now because nobody really understands how to harness that power and it could be so powerful. Sarah, I know you have some pretty split views in this area. <laughs> and <as laughs> for, for those um, of you, our, our listeners who don't know, Sarah is a former Olympian herself uh, in, in hockey and played in Torino 2006. Um, so Sarah, would just love to also get your perspective, um, given you've seen the sport and, and, and this space uh, so closely. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Nice leading question. <laughs> um, no, I, I think I have very 
just conflicting views. Every time I feel like I've sort of formed an opinion about something, I can make a counter-argument to it, um, which I think just goes into, like, one, how long it took for the NCAA to actually embrace NIL, um, and also why it's such a controversial topic. So I think there's a lot to be said for college athletes, um, like, making money, for example, on all the value that they're providing, like, that is very much a thing. Um, and for some of these people, they only have this like discrete period of time to actually capitalize on that. Um, I think the sort of counter to that is having been a female athlete um, where sort of college and potentially the Olympics was the, kind of the end of the road. Um, I think it could potentially create some very interesting team dynamics. Um, I definitely have a very idealized view on what college sports are and should be. And so I think every sport with each gender is very different. Um, and it's not like a you know blanket thing applies to men's football in yep. like the Big Ten or SEC or what have you as the same thing as, you know, women's hockey at a Ivy League college. Like it's, it's very different. Right. Um, so very long-winded way of saying, like, it's amazing that the dialogue is as kind of extensive as it is, but I think we're a long way away from what is like, the sustainable solution. Are you happy that you weren't in the age of TikTok and Instagram <laughs> and, very, and playing, very. playing sports in a very pure way, which was to play your best game and, and go win? Honestly, yes, but I feel like a dinosaur saying that, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but, you know, devil's advocate, because you and I were yeah. doing this at, at lunch, <laughs> um, devil's ad advocate for me is the social media and the way that the athletes use the social media is completely up to them. Right. Yeah. The, the following that they develop is completely up to their content and engageability and likability. And if you have athletes that play a sport, like Livy Dunn, gymnast from New Orleans. I mean, she's got millions of followers on TikTok and she's making money and it's not on her name, image, and likeness, but that was prevented before. So take name, name image, and likeness aside, college athletes were not allowed to make money oh, prior yeah. to I this. mean, I couldn't take so, any prize money playing with the national team before I started. Exactly. So college. something that completely is a different part of you as a human being that doesn't have to revolve around your gymnastics career, you could not monetize. And yeah. I think today... Um, it's really been amazing to see what these athletes are putting out there in the world of the internet from a content perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think they're all like entrepreneurs in their own right. They right? are. And you should be able to make money like doing that. And also, you know, take aside the making money, but elevating the cause. So, yeah. you know, the women um, from the Oregon basketball team, Sedona and, and other, other women on that team who were highlighting the injustices between right. what the men were receiving in the NCAA tournament versus what the women were, were receiving and the lack of gym equipment. You know, without social media, does that story get out? No, I, don't I mean, know. it became a national story. It did. Because of that. Very quickly. Yeah. And then you had brands able to respond to that. So Planet Fitness jumps in and right. now you've got these brands with budgets that are helping bridge the gap that shouldn't be a gap. Yeah. No, I, I think that's definitely fair. And I, I think I could you know, play devil's advocate with myself all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably a good segue to talk about pay equity in the world of sports. Um, and the narrative usually goes that we have to break the chicken and the egg problem in terms of the reach that men's sports get versus women's sports. So where is the latest thinking in this? Obviously, it's going to be sport specific, mm -hmm. but um, where, where is the, the latest and greatest on this? Topic? Yeah, it's that there's a lack of pay equity, I think is the narrative <laughs> still. That is not a thing that exists. Um, are we getting better? Yes, we're making strides. Um, I think about what the women in the WNBA go through as one of the gold standards. These are women who get drafted, don't necessarily make the team. Just because you're drafted doesn't give you a spot on a roster. You're still fighting. There's 144. We call it the power of the 144. It's 144 women that play professional basketball that are available for roster spots, 12 on 12 teams. The starting pay salary is, I think, less than $60,000 a year. There's a lot of women that can't live off of that. So they are forced to go play overseas. And overseas, these women will make upwards of $600,000 to a million dollars to play on a team that is not in their own country because we don't do them justice and afford them the opportunity to make a living and, and, and provide for their families. 
but we ask them to give everything that they have. We ask them for all of their time, all of their commitment, all of their work ethic, and we don't give back to them. Um, and I, I don't think that that's fair. And I think it's a shame to have to send people over to other countries because we in America can't figure it out. Why do they make, like, why is there yeah, such a pay disparity between yeah. countries? Um, I think, and, and again, I would love to bring my friends onto the podcast the next time. Um, Terry Jackson is kind of an expert at, at telling this narrative and this story, but um, the legalities of who pays for what doesn't exist over there. Mm. Um, there's less of a system and more of a... Um, the powers that be have the means and they will provide the means because of the entertainment value that it brings back. It does not necessarily have to be a money-making system. So I guess then, like I kind of, to simplify that, look at rich owner in some country overseas can choose to have this payroll for the team and therefore pay you a million dollars. There's no salary cap. Right. Um, can do whatever they want. But I guess a question for you is that's, uh, rich owners sub potentially subsidizing a team. Mm -hmm. um, I guess why hasn't the U.S. like why hasn't why doesn't the U.S. system work like that? Because of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, um, there is a literal piece of paper that is an agreement between league and union um, that states what we can do and what we cannot do, and what the salary cap is, and what um, accommodations are appropriate, and what. Um, pay is appropriate and what that pay scale looks like going from rookie year up through year five. So it is clearly defined in a document um, that we cannot deviate from. So typically when there's a clause in a document, right, it's because that clause benefits someone. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this is obvious to everybody else but me, but like who does that actually benefit, right? Because aren't you kind of capping the, to your point, potentially the amount of effort that someone puts in if they have to have like another job and this because they can't support themselves? Or if you're not capping their effort, you're capping your ability to retain them versus, you know, another country that could poach them, right? So Correct. So who, who does that clause benefit? Seems not to benefit the people getting paid nor the people paying. Right. I think that that is the fundamental thing is that... Um, CBAs work really well for people like the NFL. The NFL is a multi-billion dollar machine. That CBA makes sense. When you have a league that is not making that much money, you cannot apply the same rules that the NFL or the NBA or the MLB adhere to. And, and when you have a league like the WNBA, who is product of the NBA, and you want to mirror that CBA, it doesn't necessarily jive and it doesn't necessarily make sense, but that is like, you came from us, so you should do as we do. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things, um, we have a producer at Malka named Dre, and she is awesome, and we were working on this thing for the W, and her whole thing is, I don't want to be spoken to differently about sports because I am a woman, but I need you to tell my story differently about a female athlete because I am a woman. You cannot talk about female athletes the same way that you talk about male athletes. Yeah. There's clearly a demand for women's sports, but you can't, in the same way that you can't just take the structure of the league or the CBA and replicate it to fit women's sports, you probably can't necessarily do the format either, right? Mm -hmm. Like there've been a lot of people who've been thinking about like, do you need to change, like, for a women's professional hockey league, it shouldn't just take the NHL and replicate however many game season and do it the exact same way. Like it has to be different. Like not only like are that the the athletes are different, but like people can maybe consume that content differently. I don't know. Like I think I just think it's interesting that those conversations have started and love your take on what you're seeing in that regard. I don't know that I have enough knowledge of that space to speak. Like I haven't seen enough of that. Like what is right in front of my face are the larger sports, and I can speak to... So like WNBA, think, for example, like how would you do it differently? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what makes that exciting. It's, it, it's, to me, what blows my mind is everybody loves the NCAA basketball tournament for women. People love UConn. People cheer for UConn every year. People want to see these women play. These women are awesome players. And then what happens when you flip from taking the kid from college and making her a professional athlete that nobody's interested? Like, I don't understand what that gap is. I don't think anybody does. Otherwise, we would have fixed it by now. But like, there is some loss of interest between a woman in college and a woman who's a professional athlete. Do we not see that same like loss of steam for men when they're switching? No. 
It's the, probably the opposite. It's completely the opposite. Yeah. Draft day is the biggest day of the year for college athletes. Like That's the so NFL weird. draft and is the is biggest the thing. What is funding like for the marketing dollars at that inflection point? Because could it just be the fact that the airtime isn't given to that? Well, switch? I mean, the airtime isn't given, period, full stop, across the yeah. board. I, I think when it comes to tune in to marketing, yeah, it, it's sloppy seconds for everybody involved. I think that that we could be doing better, but I think it's something del- different. I think it's something, it's something from the viewership that does not necessarily correlate with the support level that they get for making that transition. It is something that the viewer is deciding. The viewer or, or somebody who's actually going to go buy a ticket. Like, mm-hmm. why can't we fill these stands? I don't know. And I, I, we were talking about this at lunch. I was so proud. Um, Angel City Football Club just had their first game in Los Angeles. Natalie Portman is a team owner. There's a lot of famous celebrities that are team owners. Um, they sold out that stadium. And it's amazing because LAFC is such a, it's a special stadium and it's a great spot. But to see a women's soccer team sell that out was like, made my heart so happy. (laughs) And like, I'm sure a lot of other people, but like, why can't we do that everywhere? This, I mean, and the same thing happened in Europe with a women's professional soccer game. Yeah. Over 90,000 people. It was more than the US China World Cup. Exactly. If I remember correctly. So here's the controversial question then. Um, So if the reach can never be the same, should the compensation structure be the same or at least to a certain level be the same? It should not, but um, what is going on right now is not even percentage-wise comparable. It is still that much significantly lower than if you were just to take a, a straight percentage and go across. I mean, this is where they can't even meet their basic minimum Minimum no wage in some cases. It's no like, like yeah. you know these women um, fly coach. They are seven feet tall and they're flying coach in middle seats. They don't have hotel rewards programs, so they sometimes can't even get checked into hotels on time, and they have to wait for rooms to be ready. Like the difference between just sheer like logistics of travel is is so far off. Um, so you know when you talk to these players associations and you talk to the people that are part of these leagues, it's not even necessarily about getting the money to come in. It is about creating a comfortable situation for these players. Great, Jessica. So I think this is a, a good point to touch on the infrastructure that exists around athletes uh, over the life cycle of their careers, right? So when they're at the pinnacle of their sport, there's obviously a lot of attention. There, you know, lots of people around them to support and help them thrive. Mm -hmm. Um, But as that athlete, um, you know, decides to either, you know, leave the sport entirely or make a pivot, you know, what are the organizations or bodies of support that exist around them Mm -hmm. uh, to see them through, uh, you know, various parts of their career and and also life? Yeah, I think it's super interesting. Um, Having been part of Rock Nation and now part of Malka, we are the support. It is their families. It is their agency of record. It is it is the people who are there to hold their hands from the time that they're doing their first contract, through their contract negotiations, through the ups and downs of their career, and and really work them into what the transition into after playing looks like. Right. Um, and one of the things that I'm really proud of Malka Sports specifically for is, um, you know, we have broadcasting uh, seminars and and retreats that these guys go to where we teach them how to be commentators and how to be live on camera and how to, um, you know, really carry themselves. So if they know that they want to do that, we're going to give them all of the tools that we can. Um, One of the other things now, and it was not ever available to us when we were younger (laughs) athletes, is, you know, Malka being a content studio, we can create an entire content program around that athlete. So when they leave the field, they can have a podcasting career, they can have a content series, they can have an outlet, a creative outlet that we've already built audience into. So we want to be able to help them ease out of the the career phase into whatever the next thing is by setting that up well in advance. Um, One of the things that I can tell you is that without people like us or families, the athletes are really on their own. Like there is no institutional setup where there is a group of people that are going to counsel all of these athletes who are in college who will, like, what did we decide, 98%, 99% of them will not go on to be professional athletes? Like, what do you do next? Like, um, outside of guidance counselors and mentors in college, I don't, I don't know 
who is counseling those people. Yeah, and there's a big conversation about mental health to be had around this topic because these people have dedicated their entire lives, their entire, you know, um, their total energy to excel mm -hmm. uh, in, in one particular area. And when they make that often hard decision to leave the sport, how are they doing mentally and, and, and how is the infrastructure around them helping them to deal with that? And is that different to when they don't decide to leave the sport, but they have to anyway, say due to an injury or right. you know something else? Yeah, I think all really, really valuable questions and great questions. I don't know that I have the answer exactly to all of them, but um, I do. I have seen athletes leave due to injuries, and I can tell you that's one of the hardest things I've ever had to watch when you know that you are of the caliber to perform at a professional level, but due to some career-ending injury, you now don't know who you are anymore. And it happens fast, and it happens like you fall hard, you fall really hard, and you need that group of people around you to pick you up or it can get dark and, and the mental health really becomes an issue at that point. So um, the most important thing that these athletes can do is surround themselves with the right people, um, people that they trust, their families. Um, but, but outside of that, you know, mental health is such a personal journey mm -hmm. um, that I think you can give an athlete tools, and I don't know if maybe you want to speak to this a little bit about what your personal experience was, but you can give an athlete the tools, but unless they really want to embrace that, you can't force it on them and you, no. you can't make them understand or make them hear what no. you're trying to tell them. And I think it's it's not just after sports, right? Regardless of how sports end. You could go out on the highest note, you could go out on the lowest note. I think there will always be that gap of like, who am I now? Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it is a big deal while you're playing too, yeah. right? Like mental health, I mean, there have been very sadly like a couple of recent cases of female college athletes that have really struggled, obviously. Um, and so I think, I mean, for younger athletes, like it starts with the schools and having the support systems in place. Um, I think that um, until very recently, like it's sort of embedded in you as an athlete of like you have to be tough and you always have to be okay. And if you're not strong and tough, like you're not valuable either on a team or individually and people start to question yep. like, sh you, should you even be on the team, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so there's like definitely a facade of whatever it is you're feeling, you hide that. Um, I think very recently in the case of Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, um, Michaela Schifrin, who have mm -hmm. all come out and just said, I'm not okay. And like, I need to take time to like make myself okay. And this is for the best of me and my team and all of these things. There is finally a more positive like conversation around like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like these people are still heroes. They're even more so heroes. Um, and they've made it acceptable to talk about and to feel, and you can still be the number one person in your sport and like need help. Um, and so I think the tides are starting to shift a little bit, um, but it, it sadly like takes people on that scale mm -hmm. um, and of that notoriety to like bring attention to it in a meaningful way. But isn't that vulnerability and, and the authenticity of that conversation what brands want? And to really look at the human side of sports and, and really reach their audience yes. with a very authentic message. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I think what you will see is there are more and more brands standing up and supporting people like Simone Biles was heavily supported for her decision. And not, not just outside by brands, but inside by her team. Like there was just a general overwhelming And other support. athletes, right? Other and athletes, random LeBron, sports, like, yeah. yeah. All of these people standing up and saying like, wow, like good for you. Right. You, you really, you did awesome and we're all so proud of you. But I think to your point, um, authenticity is the most important thing. And when you can feel that from an athlete, it translates to the brand. And it goes back to me saying that the more authentic a, a sports voice is, the more accepted and appreciated it will be and it will resonate and the impacts will be so great. Yeah, there's a, um, a publication called the Players' Tribune, yeah. which does a lot of like, I am an athlete in this sport or what have you from, you know, random college player all the way through to people that you read about all the time who publish very personal stories mm -hmm. about their experience with addiction or concussions mm -hmm. or like all these different things. And I think 
sort of that came about as I was sort of going through college and afterwards and was immensely helpful to like read other people's stories like that who are putting themselves out there and being insanely vulnerable yep. in situations where like it's it wasn't really socially acceptable to like say that stuff. Um, and I just think at, to your point, authenticity and being real and telling your story is so impactful um, and has such a greater reach than you'd ever think. I agree. And I think, um, you know, what you were just saying is there has always been this allure of like locker room, what happens in the locker room stays in the locker room, whether you're hurt, whether you're injured, whether there's something weird going on, like whatever it is, like that locker room is your safe space. And I think almost detrimentally so, where you were really kind of stuffing things down that you probably should have been talking about. And maybe, you know, in, in the case of like the U.S. women's gymnastics team, like not talking about things that were going on in the locker room was hurtful and harmful. And I think we need to make the locker rooms a safe space again. Yeah, I mean, I think for a locker room, right, like people, only you should be able to tell your story, right? right? So the locker room should be a safe space and that like people should be respectful of if you say something, like that's for you to tell the world if you want to Correct. or not. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think you know, stuff gets swept under the rug or hidden. There have been plenty of cases of abuse in all different forms in sports that have sort of just been kept within the team for whatever reason, and that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a former athlete, do you feel like there is a stage at your career where that's more acceptable? No, definitely not. Um, I think if you take the highest profile athletes, for example, you could look at that and say like, well, they're in this position of they've achieved so much and therefore it's easier. I, I don't think that's the case because I think they are the one that is supposed to bring home the gold, right? Like right. they're the one who everybody's watching. So the pressure that is internal and external, you're probably harder on yourself, but there is a very real outside pressure is insane. And after I think you come out and say something and withdraw or fail or whatever, there's my guess is, you know, I've never been that person, right? But my guess is there's probably very mixed feelings of insane, uh, like a huge amount of relief. Um, but also, like, I feel like I've just let everybody down. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know which one trumps the other, right? Like, Michaela Schiffer is a great example of who didn't have the best Olympic performance that I'm sure she would have liked, had been dealing with a ton of things personally leading up to that. Mm -hmm. And then in her the World Cup events afterwards, like, swept everything and crushed it, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, she clearly, like, is a very, very resilient person who bounced back and was back to kind of performing at that level. Um but I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, it's different for everybody. I think it's just as hard for everybody. I think it's different for everybody, but I think it can be just as impactful. And I think yeah. one of the things that you're, you're kind of alluding to is like if you are at the pinnacle of your career where all of the spotlight is on you and you've got all of these eyes watching, um, the thing I love so much about sports and one of the things that I took away from my time at USA Today because we were a local newspaper company that happened to have USA Today as an overlay all of these players, whether you are collegiate, whether you are professional, you impact somebody in your local neighborhood. Right. Maybe you went to high school with them. Maybe you went to college with them. Maybe they know you. You're you're on the offensive line and nobody nationally knows you, but like this guy's been following your entire career. Like, So whenever you come out, you're going to impact somebody. And I think it is so important for people that we trust because we trust athletes, people that we trust to come out and, and say that message and speak their truth because you will impact somebody. And it doesn't matter if you're Tiger Woods or if you're Johnny Linebacker on the Ohio State football team or, you know, whoever, right. whoever it is, like, your message will reach somebody. And I, right. I think we need to just make it okay to talk. Yeah, I think the whole point is like you have a platform, whether it's a national, international platform or a college locker room platform or a local community. High school. High school platform, right? You have one and it's just trying to use it for good. Exactly. So I think that point about you have a platform and it will reach somebody is a really interesting one, at least to me, mm -hmm. from the sense that I think mental health is a non-controversial topic. I know that's not, everybody's view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are social justice topics that divide people mm -hmm. as well. You know, like Colin, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick? I Kaepernick, know, Kaepernick. You, know, you did good. <laughs> All right, there you go. Um, you know, is like a great example of that, right? Yeah. Um, and you have people like 
burning their Nikes and whatever else going on because of because of statements that people have made, right? So to your point about, you know, marrying like brands and and the voice of the individual athlete mm-hmm. versus when you are that individual athlete, you have a voice that will reach people. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that they should be able to have that voice naturally and be able to say, this is what I feel, this is what I think, you know, I am going to tap out of my career here, or I am going to stand up for this social justice issue or whatever. Or do you think that if you're sponsored by a brand, you should have to run it by that brand first? I think you should be able to speak your truth. I think that you should be able to stand for whatever you believe in. Those are rights that we all have as human beings. I think that you should expect that as a public facing figure, not everybody's going to agree with you and there can be ramifications and repercussions that come along with that, such as being dropped by a brand. Right. Colin Kaepernick, prime example. There's a ton of examples. Colin Kaepernick, probably the most visible one. Um, But I don't think for one second that you as a human being should ever hold back on something that you feel passionately about. You should be able to speak your truth. And just because you are in the public eye, you should not have to censor yourself Mm -hmm. based on what other people want to hear from you. So building on that, do you think that athletes are in a unique position or should be in a position to kind of push their brand to have a certain voice that reflects some of their personal values. I absolutely do. And I think um, you see that with what Tom Brady is creating with the TB12 line. I think he's doing a really good job of that um, in not causing controversy, but making sure that every product that he puts out, he stands behind its integrity, its authenticity, what is in the product, how it is made, how it is sourced, responsibly sourced. Um, Yeah. I I think that if you are a public figure, you have the ability to take control over what your brand image is and make it what you want it to be. Again, flip side of that, not everybody's going to want that brand image. And if somebody has loved Tom Brady for all of these years and he goes and he starts making organic whatever and he becomes a vegan, but you're like... I really love steak and potatoes <laughs> and like, I don't know about the vegan stuff, Tom. Like maybe you're not going to follow him down that path. But, right. you know, I, it's again, it's just, we can't be afraid to be who we are. Like we've all been fighting to be authentically ourselves for such a long time. Like that includes celebrities, it includes athletes, it, include, it includes anybody that's a public figure. So this brings us to our final segment, Ask the Experts. And this question comes from Morgan Reba on Twitter. Her question is, I work in a male-dominated field. I sometimes feel frustrated and want to switch jobs, but I also feel inspired to work hard to bring the female perspective to these spaces and make it easier for future female employees. How do I fight this battle respectfully? Um, I think that this is a really interesting question, and it's one that I have come across a lot in my career because I have worked at some really wonderful places and I've worked at some really terrible places. (laughs) Um... You know, working in a male-dominated field, what I have found is if you are in a place where you feel frustrated and you feel like you can't make change, you are in the wrong physical space. You need to get out of that space, stay in your field, but go find... um, what, what I always refer to as my, my allies, my, the men in my career who have supported me and supported my female voice, even though we work in a male-dominated industry, you need to find people that will elevate you and that will help you find your voice and, and propel your voice around the entire office. Let it fill the office. Let your presence be felt. If you are a woman in a male-dominated company and they are hiding you in a corner and your voice isn't heard, you've got to go somewhere else. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to leave your field. It just means you need to leave your job, and that's okay. So this is like potentially a little bit controversial as a question because I don't think it should be up to that individual person to solve all the world's problems. But no. do you think that having, you know, that example that you just gave of where you're kind of shoved in a corner because yeah. it's a very male-dominated company, mm-hmm. and then as the only female voice or potentially only female voice, you leave, mm-hmm. that that then becomes more and more and more the case, like it becomes more and more of an echo chamber and there's no one there to kind of break that cycle? I have found that, and and look, every every place is different, every experience is different, um, but I have found that when you are the female voice that is getting shut down in an office, it is not going to change and it is not your job to change those people. It is your job to find a space where you can thrive and you can flourish and you can impact and create a better experience for those that are coming up underneath you. So you need to go find a place where the 
women and men that are above you in the organization will allow you to be who you are so that you can coach the people below you and pave that path. And if that's not going to happen, it is not your job to fix those people at that job. Just leave it. Right. <laughs> Just get out of there. I think that's a super way, it, like really, really interesting, good way to look at it of like, you can't, like you can be in situations where you can't change people's minds. And so leave the situation and look at things from like a go forward basis of like, what can you be in a position where you can then make change? And and as you said, pave the way for people underneath you. And also don't, don't let that situation impact you and your mental health and say, is it me? Mm-hmm. It's not you. Yeah. For sure. It's, it's really not you, it's them. It's like, really not you, actually. it's them. Like, I guarantee you, I promise you that. <laughs> but I think the onus then does go back to women in senior positions that have the platform, going back to having the platform to make change, right? So yes, yes in that moment, if you know, you're fairly early in your career, you just have to look out for yourself and make sure you can get to a position where you can impact change. Yes. And I think as a woman who is now in a position where I can impact change, there are still moments where I've been the lone voice and the lone female in the room. And I know whether or not I'm going to be able to sustain that and whether or not I'm going to have people that are supportive of me or if they're not supportive of me. So as a lone female voice, sometimes you have to make the best decision for yourself and for the generations to come that it's going to be in another place. Have you ever found yourself in a situation or like what would you recommend doing where you're the only female or one of very few and there's something that's very obvious and someone needs to say it and everyone's thinking about it, but you don't want to be the one to say it because of course it's the girl who would say it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Like what do you do in those circumstances? I say it. (laughs) I do. (laughs) I just say it. I do. And, you know, it's funny because I grew up my entire life living in New York, New Jersey, um, And I've recently moved out to LA and I just say it. And I think people in LA are like, did she just say that? (laughs) Like, they don't know what to do with me. But um, I am just, I'm such a big proponent of say what you mean, mean what you say. Show up and have an opinion because that's what you're getting paid for. They're not paying you just to sit behind your desk and pretend like you're doing work. Have an opinion. It doesn't mean that your opinion is always the right one. It doesn't always mean that it's the one that's going to bear the most weight in the argument or conversation or whatever you're talking about, but have an opinion because that triggers thought process in the rest of the people that you're sitting with. Yeah. So, you know, I think as as women, and I, I know personally myself, growing up in school, I was always the kid that was afraid to raise her hand. I was always afraid because I wasn't good at math, because I wasn't, I, I just always felt like I was going to say something wrong and it like would be perceived as wrong and I would be perceived as unintelligent. And um, one of the things that I always I have these things called McCourtisms, you guys. <laughs> like everybody that has come under me at any job knows the McCourtisms. And like I very much feel like you can learn a lot from active listening. You can learn a lot from active participation. You can learn what how to say things in an acceptable way so that you're not steamrolling people and people are hearing what you're saying. It's all in the way that you deliver. It's not in what you say, it's how you deliver it. It could be wrong as heck. Like you'd be yep. totally off the mark, but deliver it in a manner that it's receivable and you will be surprised at, at how people respond to you. For sure. I think it's interesting because, you know, you, there's two two big themes that kind of came out of each way we sliced that. The big one was, you know, build a sense of community, whether it's leave this crappy job where you're never going to get cut through and find your place, mm-hmm. or it's, you know, surround yourself with the right women, the right community yeah. to, you know, be able to bounce ideas off. And the other is have an opinion, right? Mm-hmm. So build a community, have an opinion. Do you feel like it's important to kind of voice those opinions to your community to get some sanity checks on that? Or yes. do you think that, you know, you should just... Yes, I do. I do. Um, I think I always feel things in my gut first. And my gut is usually right. Like I've grown over the years to like trust your gut. Um, but as you are a young woman or man coming up in whatever industry you're in, finding your voice is so important and being able to hone in on who you are and what your authentic voice is takes a lot of time. I think I've probably only stepped into it in like my mid to late 30s, um, really figured out who I am and how to articulate what I really mean. So I think 
it's just important to, as you're kind of coming up, have those conversations and hear what other people have to say because active listening is so important. And, and putting something out there but then receiving your feedback is really important because you're not always going to be right. right. Sometimes you are. And if you'd like to ask the experts your question about finance, careers, or women in leadership, tweet at us at Ask Money Lion to be featured on the podcast. So this comes kind of towards the end of our show, um, and we like to end every episode with a question that we ask all guests. And that question is, what person has inspired you to roar the loudest and why? Um, this is really easy for me. It is my mom and my dad for two different reasons. My dad, because I learned... I learned everything I know from my dad, whether it was skiing or golfing or the business and the industry that I'm in. Um, and my mom, because my mom just set such an amazing example. She stayed at home with us when we were kids, went back to school, got her master's degree, went back and got another master's degree, and then started a career that she's been in for over 20 years post-raising children. So, you know, they both have taught me my my dad always said, you can be anything you want to be and don't ever let anybody tell you not to. And then my mom showed me how to do that. So I love that. That's really nice. <laughs> that too? Here. You, we, need to, we need to send that sound bite to your parents. Oh my God, they'll freak out. <laughs> you should send it as an anniversary gift. I know, seriously, they'll love it. That can be an NFT. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sell it to them. Make a profit. <laughs> so guys. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. That was such a wonderful, wonderful uh, episode. And we truly, truly appreciate all your insights. Um, and thank you to our audience for listening and watching. Uh, join us next week for another episode of Women Who Roar.